യോഗേണ ചിത്തസ്യ പദേന വാചാം മലം ശരീരസ്യ ച വൈദ്യകേണ യുപാകരോത്തം പ്രവരം മുനീനാം പതഞ്ജലിം പ്രാഞ്ജലിരാനതോസ്മി സ്തുവേ പതഞ്ജലിം വ്യാസം ശങ്കരം ച മുനിത്രയം കർത്തൃസൂത്രസ്യ ഭാഷ്യ കൃമാദ് വിവരണസ്യ ച so we are continuing the discussion on one of the most important themes uh, in the practice of yoga especially from a practical point of view so patanjali defines yoga as chitta vritti nirodha that is cessation of our modification of our cessation of our misidentification with the modifications of objects arising in the mind now he gives a clear method for restraining this modification as i should remember all the major psychological problems arise from one central root cause we identify our sense of our own personality with the modifications that arise out of momentary experiences now there is a psychological implication here when we forget the momentariness of momentary experiences we get into a problem all of us have to go through different experiences every day every moment thoughts ideas arise in the mind all the five senses of perception eyes ears sense of touch sense of smell sense of touch sense of taste all these five senses and mind together connect with the external objects we see objects we communicate with objects through voice noise coming from objects we communicate with objects through taste when we taste something we enjoy we are caught we touch something we identify our sense of personality with the one with this psychophysical mechanism which is enjoying this taste or touch or smell or whatever may be when this uh, attraction becomes a bondage we are caught we lose our sense of personality the only way to come out of this problem according to patanjali is stopping this misidentification and this is possible through two techniques repeated practice called abhyasa and the practice of dispassion or detachment called vairagya now i mentioned earlier all problems arise when we forget the fact that these experiences are momentary momentary in the sense they come and go we lose money we become depressed some near and dear ones die we become depressed now for the time being we forget that money is not a permanent entity we forget the impermanence of wealth and we also forget the impermanence of human life when the impermanence or the momentariness is forgotten we get attached now you should remember the word attachment i should explain in the sanskrit text you find the word vairagyam is translated as atta- as detachment or non attachment it doesn't have a negative connotation because what patanjali means is we become slavishly obsessed with certain things our desire enslaves our mind 
it binds us to the object. It is this phenomenon that is called attachment. When we remember that all these experiences are momentary, what happens? We are making use of dispassion or detachment as a tool to break this bondage, to liberate ourselves from this slavery. Now, this should be explained in detail. That's why I am, this is not a repetition. We are discussing different aspects of this detachment, dispassion, called vairagyam in Sanskrit, and abhyasa called repetition. Now, one major problem that people often raise again and again is, when do we start? When do we begin? How do we begin? And then how we continue? That's a big, big problem. And what happens if we fail? Here, where Patanjali doesn't deal elaborately with this subject, some other scriptures give a more graphic description of this problem. How do we start a new life? Suppose we all read Patanjali Yoga Sutras. We read spiritual literature and we have some problems. We are convinced that if you practice some of these ideas, some of these teachings, we can have a better life. We can change our life. We can improve our day-to-day -day activities, day-to-day -day life. But where do we begin and how do we begin? It's a big question. The moment you, you begin and begin, and if you start thinking of this, you try to, you, you, you have a, you, you make an effort to begin, immediately there is one problem. There is a conflict between what we want to do and what we are able to do. I mentioned this earlier. The conflict between will and mind. What mind is willing to do, what mind allows us to do, and what the will wants us to do. If we can do whatever we want to do, there will be no problem for any of us, because there is nobody in the world who doesn't want peace of mind. And these days, everyone knows some techniques by reading, by listening to lectures, by praying, by interacting with people who are spiritually oriented, we, all of us, have got some ideas how to, do, how to do good things, how to practice spirituality. If you, in the San Francisco city, if you go, the, you won't find 10 people who will say, well, I don't want to have a good life. Everyone wants to have a good life. Everyone wants to have peace of mind, to enjoy peace of mind, to live a stress-free life. Everyone wants it. Nobody would say, I want plenty of stress, plenty of mental disturbance. Nobody would say. But then where do we fail? We are not able to make a start. This problem has been dealt with. Why we are not able to begin? Why we are not able to begin a beginning according to Patanjali's system? As I mentioned earlier, our mind contains tendencies and impressions of all types. Some of them are very good, some of them are very bad. Some of them prevent us from doing something, doing some good deeds. Some of them may help us, may encourage us in doing good things. So, one single solution that is given by all great Vedantins and yoga philosophers is go on doing good deeds. Go on doing good deeds. Go on doing, thinking good thoughts. It's not easy. It's not very easy. You, we would like to do good things, but we cannot. We would like to think good thoughts, but we cannot. Thinking good thought is a subtle process, abstract. 
But doing good deeds is comparatively easy because it involves only physical body. Where physical body alone is involved or physical body and mind are equally involved, it is comparatively easy. Where mind alone is involved, where body is not involved, it is very abstract, very difficult. Because mind is subtle, comparatively body is gross. So one solution that is given is go on doing good deeds, go on thinking good thoughts. That will help us to accumulate good tendencies, good impressions. We have to remember what we mentioned earlier. Every action produces vritti or modification. Modification becomes a tendency or samskara. Samskara becomes a vasana. Vasana is nothing but a tendency which becomes action-oriented. And every action-oriented tendency called vasana will make us determine to do something. And every action that we do produces the results, modifications. This cycle continues. So go on doing good deeds, good thoughts. That's what what, that's one solution that is given. Then we must continue. And now, how to continue? In the 13th Sutra, Padanjali says, Tatra sthidau yatnaha abhyasaha. Tatra sthidau. Sthidau, I don't want to give the grammatical details for those who are interested. It's called Nemita Saptami, one of the five major divisions of the seventh case in Sanskrit grammar, which I won't want to deal with. Abhyasa is defined here. Trying to practice dispassion, detachment, and this repeated attempt to practice dispassion is called repetition or abhyasa. It is mentioned here. Now, this again will raise a question. As I mentioned earlier, how to practice, how to start, how to continue, and what happens if you fail. That's a major problem. How to begin, and then how to continue. Now, how to continue, that question is related to the third question, what happens if you fail? We often find we make an attempt and we do not succeed. Now, this question is dealt with elaborately in another text that is in the Bhagavad Gita is mentioned in the sixth chapter. This problem is dealt with. In fact, in this Gita, Arjuna also raises the same doubt. How to control the mind how to restrain. In fact, the subject dealt with in the Padanjali Yoga Sutras is also dealt with in the Bhagavad Gita. There, Arjuna asks one question. Chanchalam ki manakrishna pramathi belavad dridham tasyakam nigriham manne vayoriva sudhuskaram. It's a famous verse in the 6th chapter of the Gita, 33rd verse. The meaning is this. O Lord Krishna, my mind is highly unstable, wavering. To restrain my mind, to continue this practice, restraining these modifications, is like catching the air, restraining the wind that is blowing. We cannot do that. So how to do this? This question is raised by uh, Arjuna. And the answer given by Lord Krishna is this. The same words are used by Lord Krishna. The Bhagavad Gita is at least older than the Padanjali Yoga system by at least 3,000 years. Padanjali system, Padanjali sutras are comparatively new. So Lord Krishna makes an important statement. How to control the mind? Abhyasenudu kaundeya vairagyena repeated action and dispassion. What really happens is when you practice dispassion you realize the momentariness. See, as I mentioned uh, earlier suppose we lose money. I am giving the same example because that's the that's most common problems and that is something which everyone understands. We lose money. 
we become upset. We become upset because we think money is a permanent entity. Money can give us something permanent, peace, of, peace happiness, status, joy, enjoyment, and so on. But reality is money cannot give us anything eternal or everlasting. Money cannot uh, give us permanent joy. So whatever money or wealth gives us is impermanent. In the sense, it may be of use to us, but it, it's not something eternal. Now, the moment you realize that this is not eternal, what happens? We withdraw the mind from wealth. Then if the stock markets collapse, it will not upset the mind. We may work hard. It doesn't mean that we should not work, work for wealth or comforts or anything. No, Patanjali system is not called blooded asceticism. Patanjali system is something that helps us to face our day-to-day -day problems in a very intelligent, pragmatic way. So sometimes, you know, people have a wrong notion that Patanjali asks us to go to a forest and throw away everything and sit there under a tree without any con connection with the, the realities of day-to-day -day life. No. Patanjali system is a method of teaching us how to live a healthy and intelligent and balanced life right in this world. So here the question arises uh, how to detach the mind and how to practice this vairagyam. Vairagyam means dispassion or detachment. Detachment and dispassion is not very difficult to practice when you realize that what enslaves you, what makes you obsessed with, is not of permanent entity. It is not permanent, it's not everlasting. You never get attached to something which you know to be, to be totally momentary, changeable. For the time being, we believe that it is permanent. It is this mistaking of the impermanent for the permanent the momentary for the eternal, that, that makes us enslaved. That creates this attachment. At the moment we realize the momentariness, we can become totally detached, non-attached. So that's one method that's given here. Now, in the Gita, the student puts one very simple question. Suppose we fail. That's another fear. How to begin, that's one problem. How to continue, that's second problem. The third problem is the fear, the constant fear, if we do not succeed. Ayadi sadhyo pedo yoga chalida manasaka aprapi yoga samsiddhim kam gatim krishna gachadi. Very simple question is put before Arjuna by Krishna, sorry, by Arjuna to Krishna in the Gita, in the sixth chapter. You practice yoga meditation for a long time. Many people do not succeed. Some people will have a deviation, a fall. Some people forget for some time. Suppose in the early days we practice yoga and meditation, then we forget all about it. We, people start living a very worldly life. Is everything lost? Or people die before they completely are able to control their mind. That's a question which Arjuna puts before Krishna. Ayadi suddhayo pedu yoga chalida manasaha. What is called abhyasa and vairagya in this sutra is put by Krishna in another language called yoga. Suppose somebody falls away from the path of yoga. Is everything lost? And Arjuna continues the question. He says, Here Arjuna compares the mind of a person who fails in yoga or this uh, yoga practice to a, to a patch of cloud that, is, that moves away from its main body in the air. You know, more clouds move in, in big 
uh, patches. Suppose a piece of cloud is broken and moves away and is blown away by the strong wind. By the strong wind, what happens? That cloud may slowly wither away. It loses individuality. Like that, what happens to people who try to practice yoga but fail? Who should have made their efforts to succeed in this worldly life but instead spend many years to read, reading scriptures, trying to meditate, and then completely lost their path. So what happens? They lose both the world. They don't succeed in secular material life, and they are not able to succeed in spiritual life. So Ubhayavibhrashtra means lost this world and also next. Spiritually, you could not reach your goal. And in material life, you did not succeed. So it is a total loss. This question is put by Arjuna to his teacher. In answer to this question, Krishna gives an answer, which is perhaps which should be written by all of us in gold letters in our sitting room every day. Parthana Iveka Namutra Vinasas Tassi Vidyade Naki Kalyana Krit Kaschi Durgadim Tada Gachari. This is the answer. Oh, Arjuna, you won't lose anything. We literally, it means if you practice meditation or yoga or spiritual life for half an hour in your whole life, maybe one year, or if you have done one small little deed, or if you had just thought for a fraction of a minute, one noble thought in your mind, that will not be lost. That will remain somewhere. And that little bit of spiritual practice or noble thought will help you in your next life. Because Vedanta and Yoga looks upon human personality or human life, it doesn't look upon human life as a single journey, as a single chance. This abhyasa you cannot, you, 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 you can practice even in your next life. If you have not fully succeeded, you will continue that in your next life. So Krishna says, whatever little you practice, its effect will never be lost. It will remain in your account in the spiritual bank. That's why sometimes at one turn of our life, we feel a mysterious, a, a inexplicable, mysterious interest in spiritual life. People may sometimes try to explain, well, he had a big problem, therefore he started meditating. But people who have problems don't always start meditation. They go to, uh, they start drinking or they start taking drugs. They're trying, to, they're trying to run away from problems. They're trying to run away from themselves. So how our mind reacts to situations, how our mind reacts to worldly experiences, worldly challenges and critical situations and crises depends upon what, we have what spiritual wealth we have accumulated in our system. And this comes not only from this life, from the next life also. And also, it continues in the next life, it comes from previous life. So whatever tendencies and impressions we have got within us comes from previous life, and whatever we have accumulated in this life will continue in our next life. That's the idea behind it. So it is not just one life. So, whatever you do, it will remain in our account. Now, Lord Krishna gives a very interesting explanation of how this works. He says, Tatradam buddhisam yogam lebhade pauradekhikam. That's me. Kriyadecha tato bhuyas samsiddho kurinandana. Purva abhyasena tenaiva kriyadekhi avasho pisaka. It's a very famous statement. I'm quoting this verse because some of you may be able to read the text and see the grand statements. Purva abhyasena tenaiva kriyadekhi avasho pisaka. The meaning is this. You are helpless. When you, wear, 
when your mind feels like well i must go and meditate i must try to restrain my mind it because you are totally helpless avashaka means you are not within your own control you are totally helpless you are a tool and instrument in the hands of the mighty karma and its results that come from previous life because we have meditated in the past now if a problem arises we go to vedanta society and try to meditate or we go to buddhist society or a church or synagogue whatever may be we go to library and take a mystical work we take a spiritual work and we start reading we don't people don't go such people don't go to drugs or drinks or alcohol instead of instead of what they do they go to a church they go to temple they go to a mosque why he says you know purabhyasena tenaiva lord krishna says this abhyasa you have been practicing this purva means from previous life you have done it in the past so what you have done in the past it may not be last life it may be several hundreds of lives earlier we have meditated we have listened to spiritual ideas we have read a holy book all this we have accumulated so we are totally helpless so even if you try to tell a lie you cannot tell a lie there are people so well there are people some people who can never tell a truth because they have been telling lies all their life so that samskara tendency forces them to tell a lie even when they take a strong determination to tell the truth and there are people who cannot tell a lie because their mind is so oriented that they cannot tell psychologically they are incapable of telling a lie so krishna uses the word purvabhyasena tenaiva kriyadehi avashopi so means you are totally helpless please remember it doesn't mean predeterminism it doesn't mean fatalism they should be clearly understood sometimes these words could be misunderstood misconstrued as predeterminism or fatalism no predeterminism or fatalism is essentially a negative approach whatever good things you are trying to do it will not be productive because it is predetermined predestined this is just the opposite of it what vedanta and yoga tell us is this every minute every opportunity gives us a chance to start a new life to start a new chapter in our life every minute we are never late and whatever little we do will never be lost every minute every noble thought every noble act gives us a chance to start a new life to start a new chapter in our life why because we can add spiritual capital to our accumulated account that's what krishna says the now patanjali says tatra sthido yatnaka effort effort to attain this steady state of mind and continued practice continuous practice is an effort to attain this steady state of mind that is called abhyasa now we are going to deal with the other topic that is called vairagya of course uh, i have already dealt with the subject the 14 sutra uh, patanjali makes a statement uh, this long practice without any interruption should be done with great devotion with great love with great uh, respect for what we are practicing so it means it should be done with great knowledge great consciousness with great faith in fact faith is an important thing faith uh, removes many doubts strong faith that's why in the old scriptures it is say edeva vidya karodi sadhaya upanishada tadeva viryavattaram bhavadi so whatever effort we make to remember that these worldly enjoyments these unfortunate events that are that we have to face or the happy 
experiences that we undergo. They will not be the same for all time. They will, they are part of a changing phenomena. If once we realize this, we can break the link that connects our mind with what happens around us with these modifications. And this breaking of the link is what is called dispassion or vairagya or detachment. This dispassion or detachment is not just a temporary detachment, not lack of interest, because people sometimes lose interest. People who are get who get old, they lose interest in worldly enjoyments. Or when people are not in a position to enjoy things, they also lose interest. Or people who do not believe in God have no interest in heavenly pleasures because they don't believe in that. But this real detachment is a complete absence of desire or reducing desire. And this is possible only through a higher awareness and this is possible only through detachment. So, now, in the continuing verses, Lord Krishna makes a, another interesting statement. How are we able to continue this practice of Abhyasa? So, he says, those who have completely succeeded in practicing this dispassion, detachment, who have developed a higher interest in spiritual practices. But still, somewhere within the mind, a little desire is left. What happens? Uh, such people will be born in a family where whatever little desire is still left to be fulfilled could be fulfilled easily and they can move forward. Now, all these statements are made with one great promise. Whatever you do, even a little practice to um, attain this dispassion, detachment for worldly pleasures, even a little practice will be productive and constructive, will never go in vain. There are two categories according to Bhagavad Gita among people who try to practice this. There are those who are highly evolved. They don't have any worldly ambitions, no worldly, no desire for worldly pleasures. They're fully established in this dispassion, but still they did not attain samadhi, the highest enlightenment. Before that, perhaps they may die. Krishna says, those people will be born in a family where the parents are themselves practitioners of yoga and where they can continue their practice and attain the highest illumination. They are the higher people, more evolved people. And what about those who have not reached this level of spiritual enlightenment, illumination? They, they, as I said earlier, they practiced for a long time, made some progress, but still there are some desires within the system. So such people will be born in a family where they will have a spiritually healthy environment. Parents may ask them to meditate when they are young. They, will, they may get a chance to read the scriptures, to listen to these ideas. At the same time, they may have the worldly, they may have the secular uh, worldly opportunities to fulfill their unfulfilled des desires that come from previous life so that they can move on to the next life. In this way, one can finally attain the spiritual goal. So in other words, Abhyasa is a very, very important thing. As I said earlier, the first problem, how to start. So, 
all the negative tendencies and impressions that we have gathered in previous life will come as a mighty force. That's how the mind suddenly prevents us from continuing spiritual practice for a long time. Negative ideas come to the mind. Revolting ideas come to the mind. Sometimes restlessness and uh, negative thought currents, disturbance, all these problems may arise in the mind. Why? Because the force of negative impressions and tendencies coming from previous life, previous actions in previous life are trying to prevent us. Once we understand this, Padanjali says, we know how the mind is playing tricks. So that will help us to continue the spiritual practice. So once we understand this, we can make a start. How to continue? There also the problem is there. Whenever an obstacle, a negative thought current comes to the mind, we must be very much aware. That's why in the system, Padanjali system and also in your Vedanta system, one important condition for continued practice of Abhyasa is constant uh, communication, constant communion with these spiritual ideas. We must communicate with people. We must be in the company of people whose association will help us in continuing spiritual practice. There are people who may try to tell us, well, uh, there, is, there is no point in yoga. Life is meant for enjoyment, nothing more. Now, if we are beginners, we may be converted to their side. If we are advanced, then we may be able to resist such negative ideas. If we are still more advanced, we will be able to convert the other man to our path. This is always possible. For the beginner, it's always important to be in the company of people and ideas that help us in our spiritual life. That's why I last, last time I mentioned this karma shaya, I mentioned here, klesha mula, karma shayu, drishta, adrishta, vedani, is mentioned here. I mean, the residue, I mean, the latent deposit of karma is to be experienced either in this life or in life to come. Whatever we have done has created a residue in the form of a modification, vritti or a samskara or a tendency, and that will prompt us to continue the same action if the action produces positive results and will force us to avoid those actions if those actions have produced negative results. So, and then again I mentioned earlier, this karma has got two dimensions. The individual dimension, the microcosm, its effect in our own samskara, in our own mind, and also its effect on the cosmic mind. So, uh, at one stage, you will learn that Padanjali says, according to the yoga system, the mind is one, the cosmic mind. Once we try, once we attain a higher level of mental purity, once we succeed in completely controlling or restraining our misidentification with the, with the constantly changing and arising modifications, then we will be able to identify ourselves with the cosmic mind and that's how people attain supernatural powers which will be described in the third chapter the called Vibhutipada find ESP, extrasensory perception, telepathy and many such yogic powers which are described in the yoga text are all the result of this constant practice of Abhyasa and Vairakya. Once we succeed in stopping this misidentification with the emerging and changing experiences. And once we get fully established in this, then we are we will be able to understand our identity and oneness with the cosmic mind. That's how such people are able to communicate at a higher level than the five the levels of the five senses and mind that we normally have. Now we will have interaction. 
you can ask questions based on what i have discussed so far and also in the general way in the last class we had more questions we didn't have enough time to answer so any subject that you want to discuss we can discuss you can mr what we discussed today what we try to discuss today was different aspects of this abhyasa and vairagya because abhyasa and vairagya constitute the method of restraining or misidentification with the modifications that's all Patanjali also says yoga also yes all see, these are by products but they are not the goal in itself yeah but if if, if one uh, gets swept off by these powers then your progress to higher life higher levels of yoga will be blocked because anybody who gets attracted to a siddhis is bound to fall and he will have to start all over again the next life that's a point so see these are by products actually they are not supernatural they are natural powers you can see martial arts could break uh, stones and uh, heavy things because they constantly practice with the physical body mind also works like that so uh they are not supernatural they are natural actually they are not supernatural uh see, when we uh, succeed in focusing our mind on one particular object mind becomes a powerful weapon mind becomes sharp that's called egagra the last that mean the fourth state the fourth category of mind you know that is kshipta vikshipta uh, kshipta moda vikshipta egagra this is fourth state so at egagra state mind becomes a strong sharp weapon and it could focus on an object and once it's able to focus on one object it can grasp things i can give an example suppose you are reading a book you have you are holding the book in your hand you are reading a verse or a sentence now when you are reading the sentence on the one hand your mind is trying to focus on the sentence you are reading its meaning on the other hand you are holding the book suppose an ant bites your fingers with which you are holding the book you feel the pain what does it mean a part of the mind is dragged by the sense of touch so mind is not fully concentrated at that time if you hear the noise of a vehicle moving the street a part of the mind is dragged by the sense of hearing and if there is some sandal paste or some perfume in the neighborhood you feel the smell so mind is dragged by these five senses to us five different objects this means mind is not fully focused if you are fully focused on what you are reading you will never forget it a single reading with full concentration is enough for you to remember for your whole life may be difficult to believe unless we practice that is why great you have heard of shankaracharya अष्टमे चुरो वेदा द्वादे सर्वशास्त्रवेद षोडशे भाष्यम द्वात्रिंशे मुनिरभ्यगा शंकराचार्य लीव्ड ओनली फॉर थर्टी टू इयर्स एंड इज द ऑर्डर ऑफ द मोस्ट ब्यूटीफुल सैंस्क्रिट पॉयट्री हिम्स इन सैंस्क्रिट लैंग्वेज थर्टी सिक्स पॉइंट्स ही इज द ऑर्डर ऑफ द मोस्ट प्रफाउंड वेदांतिक टेक्स्ट टूडे वी रीड ओबनिशस एंड गीता बिकॉज शंकराचार्य रोड कमेंट्री if you had not written these books upanishads will never understand you would not be talking about vedanta or yoga today yoga also was clearly the, the commentary was written by shankaracharya most prominent commentary he was the one who traveled all over india india of those days you know today's bangladesh and afghanistan pakistan sri lanka all put together huge subcontinent and he traveled no less than four times 
all the way from Cape Comrin to Indochina border, Badrinath, 4,000 kilometers, 3,500 miles away, and four times. And the, to the puja practice, the worship practice that we do today is creation. And today we got Vedanta. Vedas got good meaning because of Shankaracharya's commentary. He was the one who first gave a philosophical meaning to this Vedic statement. If you read some of these statements of the early Indologists, they will tell you the Vedas and Vedanta, these are all ignorant, meaningless words and ballads uh, sung by cowboys in, in maybe 4,000 years back. That's, the, that's how they judged Veda. It would have been so if Shankaracharya had not written commentary. Upanishads got a meaning because of Shankaracharya. And he says, Ashtame Chaduro Vedan. He was eight years old, all the four Vedas he had memorized. And so, Dwadashe Sarva Shastravid. By twelfth year, he had learned all the branches of, mastered all the branches of learning. And all these mighty books, all these mighty philosophical works were written when you were 16 years old. So, the greatest and most profound Vedantic texts were written by a boy of 16 years old who must be going to some uh, primary schools, maybe higher, higher sc high school, uh, was written by a high school boy that age. And he passed away in 32nd year. Swami Vivekananda. And you, you, you can think of Newton, for example. Newton, it is said, that Newton was, when Newton lived in his home, his guests came, whom he had invited earlier, and they found, they found Newton had completely forgotten that he had invited these guests. They had to go back. Newton did not recognize them, it seems, because he was always thinking, contemplating on his scientific ideas and all that. So at one stage, when your mind is completely focused on something, immediately nature reveals its secrets. Nature is forced to reveal its secrets when the mind knocks at the door of mysteries of nature. Nature cannot hold it back again. So, as I said earlier, supernatural powers are nothing but the products of concentrated minds. Mind becomes sharp and focused, and nature reveals its many secrets which we foolishly call supernatural powers, which are really natural powers only. anymore. Here, yes, yes. Here we were discussing about the concentration of mind. They had complete dispassion towards everything else other than what they were focusing on. A spiritual seeker focuses on restraining the modifications, stopping. He tries to stop misidentification with the modifications of sensory experiences. As a result of this, the mind gets completely uh, free from, becomes completely free from all other modifications. So whatever such a mind focuses on, it does with 100% concentration. There is a difference, of course, between the quality, the type of concentration of an Einstein or Newton and the concentration of spiritual seekers like Shankara, Vivekananda. There is a difference, of course. In, this, in the former case, they were not interested in anything other than science or the research, scientific contemplation. This is an example of what wonderful uh, powers mind can attain by 
getting completely concentrated on whatever you are doing. Complete uh, absence of distraction of mental energy and focus. Yes, the highest spiritual realization is possible for householders. In fact, many of the great teachers of the Vedic age were householders. Uh, in many cases, they, were, they had already completed their household obligations and retired forest hermitages where they lived and meditated upon the Supreme God. And one of the greatest teachers of the Upanishadic period was Janaka, who was an emperor, who was busy with all his duties and responsibilities. So, uh, to give an example, and once it... it yes, yeah, but before that, they had already practiced this abhyasa, concentration, meditation, and they have realized the momentariness, as I said earlier, you know, the momentariness of all these phenomena, things. So, even while being in, even when they were engaged in their secular duties and responsibilities, they were not enslaved by those experiences. So one can live in this world, do our duties and responsibilities, be in the midst of our duties and responsibilities, still live a life which is not a worldly life. We can be in the world still, still without being worldly minded. Worldly mindedness is one thing. Living the world is something else. So you're saying that with the understanding of the momentariness of each, each event, each conflict, each happiness, each adversity, each destruction, that it's just lived in the moment, in the next moment, and then you can do that. No, I'm not talking about this, the doctrine of momentariness as understood in Buddhist philosophy. I was here talking about a practical, simple thing. Whatever happens which normally agitates our mind, makes us upset, if you realize it's momentary nature, then our mind will not be upset by this. Often we forget the momentariness of these things. I mean, the, the all the money, wealth, status, uh, death, uh, life, death of near and dear ones, you know, all these normally are important topics that agitate our mind at one stage or other. Once we understand that all these are pass, passing phenomena, which come and go, then we won't run away from it. We need not run away. But we realize even while being engaged in our duties and responsibilities in this world, we can still remember that, well, all these are changeable things. But I am not this physical or psychological mechanism, which is uh, to be upset by all these passing phenomena. I am the Atman, or in, in the yoga tradition, we can say, we will, I am not just a psychophysical mechanism that identifies itself with every momentary sensory experience. That's what we are trying to do in yoga. So we combine yoga and Vedanta, it becomes a complete system. Vedanta tells us what we are. Yoga makes the road to reach this goal. It prepares the ground to reach this goal. Yoga is a means. Vedanta gives us the goal. In fact, we all come and discuss these things at least for the time being, we think, well, this is something worthwhile. After all, by reading yoga and Vedanta, we don't get anything. And we give up many other pursuits and concentrate on these topics because we feel that this is, though it doesn't bring us any worldly pleasure or worldly benefits, 
it is much more precious than the worldly pursuits. So that's why we are focusing on spiritual topics. All the time, every day in our life, we try to put things in an order of priorities. We always do. What we had to do, we had to remember at one point that there is something which cannot be purchased, which cannot be bought by wealth or power or anything, and that is our own inner self. That's what yoga and, yoga and Vedanta teaches us. Well, you know, if you do, in the, the context, we should come to the context. Arjuna is asking a simple question. I am trying, trying to practice yoga. But suppose I don't succeed, what happens? So Krishna promises him, well, try to practice a little. Whatever bad thing you have done, that will be countered by the good things that you do. It neutralizes him. So, Arjuna's question was not about bad things that he was doing. His question was, in this context, is what happens if I don't fully succeed in this life? If I don't fully succeed in what I am doing? Because the undercurrent of Arjuna's question was, do I have only one chance, only one life? If you have got only one life, it is the most terrible thing. See, if you ask a, uh, an athlete, you have to practice only once. If once, if you don't reach the minimum level, you will be, you'll be cancelled. Your chance will be cancelled. It's a terrible thing. So behind the, all this, yoga and Vedanta emphasizes one point. You don't have just one chance. Life is not just one opportunity. Life continues. So, Arjuna's question is very logical from the standpoint of a person who may think that life is only one chance. No. According to Yoga and Vedanta, life moves in cycles. So, Krishna consoles him by saying, well, you don't have just one chance. That is, tatratam buddhisam yogam labhade paurodihim. I shall explain this. In the next life, what happens? Whatever little spiritual practice you have done in this life, that remains in the mind. And in the next life, when you happen to come in contact with any spiritual idea, your mind, which is enriched by this little spiritual practice that you have done in this life, that mind will show a tendency to move to spiritual ideas. Suppose we, we live in society where there are people of different categories. If we show a natural tendency to discuss spiritual ideas with people who are interested in spiritual life, it means we have in our system something that connects with this spiritual environment. So that's why the body that you had in previous life, Paurodehi means your body in previous life, or your mind, have gathered, accumulated some spiritual tendencies and impressions which remain with you, with which you have come to this life. In this life, you meet, you encounter different types of situations. Some of them may not be good for spiritual life, some of them may be very bad. Some of them may be good for spiritual life. The good spiritual tendencies in your mind stuff will force you to connect with spiritual ideas. And the bad tendencies may force you to connect with people with the wrong ideas. That's true. But Krishna's main focus is this. Whatever you little do will not be lost. So continue doing good things. That's he emphasizes. Don't worry. 
because if i do if i try to do something still if i don't succeed in this life if people die that in one life everything will be lost no you will get a chance you will reap the harvest in next life so the focus of the answer and the question is this you don't have just one chance for good and bad but it gives a great promise if we may if we if we commit mistakes well no problem you continue doing good things there is no hell fire waiting for you you continue doing good things service mentally physically good deeds and selfish acts good thoughts noble thoughts continue doing it that's why how to start if that's the biggest problem in spiritual life you find people face this procrastination that's what many psychologists will tell you mostly mind which is which has got a negative bend of my which negative uh, turn will try to tell us suggest well we will do tomorrow postponement of procrastination is one trick which mind plays again absent total lack of steadiness is another problem which mind plays with us and doubts and wavering all these are related to of course the natural state of mind which is unsteady so this unsteadiness is the natural state of human mind steadiness is attained by focusing on one spiritual ideal that's why to begin with we must fo- try to focus our mind on one good noble higher ideal that, that, that that's very protective very constructive because that way the mind is withdrawn from all other lower levels lower ideas and focused on the higher ideal from there you can practice dispassion so when you try to focus the mind on a higher ideal what what happens good thoughts higher thoughts come to the mind that means mind stuff chittam gets enriched by positive thought currents mind uh, sometimes revolts it rebels when we try to practice spirituality because mind is not ready mind has got a lot of negative tendencies that's why mind re- mind rebels every human every hum, every human being has got one focus so if mind procra- tries to create obstacles it because is because mind is right now in a state of unsteadiness because of unhealthy thought currents unhealthy tendencies accumulated through unhealthy actions in the previous life which can be countered only through healthy thought currents healthy actions so every bad thought can be countered by a good thought that's that is an that's an important contribution of patanjali system very important contribution in fact one main area of difference between western psychology and patanjali psych- system is this western psychology doesn't make a clear distinction between vritti and samskara the modifications that arise out of individual actions and thought currents and the accumulated samskaras which become a positive tendency which drives you towards certain actions this distinction has not been made patanjali says when vrittis become samskara they become a tendency and that tendency becomes a tendency to do certain things and that tendency to do certain things leads to the formation of will which is a sankalpa the will forces you to do certain things and that again produces modifications this is cycle continues the whole thing can be stopped by constant practice of dispassion dispassion doesn't mean indifference negligence dispassion means you are just cutting that rope the link that binds you with what happens around you with your own mind when you are not 
passionate, we are not, we are, when you are not attached, you can be free. Not only that, non-attachment or, dip, or dispassion helps us to conserve energy. Mental energy, psychological energy, get dissipated through attachment. Mind gets dissipated, distracted, and mind becomes blunt, incapable of concentration. Through dispassion and detachment, you know what happens? This dissipation, waste of energy, psychological energy, can be stopped and energy can be conserved. That's the secret of great geniuses. Geniuses, who is a genius? It can be only explained in two different ways. One, one method is accumulated tendencies in one area that come from previous life. The other one, when you are able to focus completely your mind, whole mental energy in one subject, it also becomes manifest as a genius. Ekagra, it is called. The fourth state of human mind. Kshipta, Vikshipta. Kshipta, Moda, Vikshipta, Egagra. At that state, you become a genius. That's what happens. So those who have got IQ you know, 120, above 120, who are able to do great things, you know, every, they may do many things, multiple things, but when they are doing different things, at that moment, they are fully focused on that particular activity. Yeah, Ekakra state is not necessarily a spiritual state. You reach a spiritual state, only Niruddha state, where you reach complete cessation of my, my, misidentification with modifications. But I'm giving an example of the power of mental concentration. I'm giving an example of power of mental concentration because the whole subject uh, uh, came up when one of our friends asked this question to supernatural powers. Nothing but the results of uh, mental focus, mental concentration. All the energy focusing on one object. So I was giving an example of this. It is The genius is not necessarily the state of a spiritual achievement. Not at all. Very often it could be the other way around also. It could be totally different. Many scourges of humanity had terrible powers of concentration. They were not spiritual people. Many, many villains of human history <laughs> had tremendous mental power, powers of concentration. But they were not spiritual. I'm just giving an example, different types of examples of the byproducts of mental concentration. What happens when we are able to fully concentrate on mind on one particular area? Just giving examples, that's all. Not necessarily spiritual. But, but even when we do good actions, at some point we have to become dispassionate about those good actions, too. I mean, rather than taking credit for them and, and, and you know, getting more involved in, in them rather than... In doing good things? Yes, good things. I mean, at some point you have to have dispassion for that, too. Yes, that's true. You know, even when, suppose we are doing good things and we become fully attached to that, uh, in a way, that is a passing phenomenon, passing phase. Uh, we normally, uh, no, if not in this life, next life, we evolve still further. We should always remember, you know, it's not complacency, but we have to remember life is not just one chance. That should be always kept in mind when we study yoga philosophy. Life is not just one chance. So if we are too eager, too fast, too uh, restless to achieve everything in one, one life, immediately right now, it will be a serious, very serious mistake. That's an important point, remember. Life is not just one chance. So love karma 
belief in the doctrine of rebirth and law of karma should be taken for granted when we start studying yoga and vedanta they are very important in understanding the dynamics of yoga and vedanta the doctrine of law of karma and the doctrine of rebirth decided by om shanti 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 hari om tat sat sirona kshnat paramastha